Hello, everybody. Um, apologies for being a few minutes late here. Um, we we're just dealing with some low resolution issues, which appears to be um, uh, possibly still inflicting us. So bear with us on the resolution. Um, if anything becomes a problem, I will try and fix it um, in the moment, but hopefully it's, uh, it's sufficient to get to, to uh, let Kevin, our presenter, um, get through his presentation. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, and we can go ahead and just dive right into this. So a little bit about the presenters and organizers who pulled this presentation together. Um, I'm Brandon Berry. I'm the ASRG North America coordinator. So I help organize the chapters in the North America. Um, and I am the CEO of a company called Black Harbor that operates out of Detroit, pr predominantly performing security services for the automotive industry. Um, Ikjo, I'll let you present yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ikjo Tseni, and I'm ASRG lead at Windsor, Ontario uh, chapter, and I'm assistant professor at University of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. Great. Thanks, Barry. So John's not here today. Um, what we're trying to do is get some of these webinars organized around the world. It's usually late for John. He's over in Europe. So uh, uh, apologies if you guys miss him. Um, so yeah, I will introduce here the, uh, the mission, what the ASRG is all about. Three kind of really core things that we stand for. Knowledge, networking, and collaboration. Um, knowledge, we're trying to bring together um, really knowledgeable individuals doing the work day to day in automotive security um, with some of the best car hackers around the world, um, providing platforms to provide education so that someone entering automotive, the automotive security space can uh, learn some things. Um, knowledge is a really fundamental pillar to the ASRG. Networking, we want to make sure that those same people are interacting with each other. Um, you know, finding opportunity, whether employment or business opportunity, um, or really just meeting some great people and having a good time. I, that's what this is all about, is uh, creating a community for the automotive security um, uh, industry. Um, and then finally, collaboration. How do we get people working to, together on really great things? I mean, we have so many projects coming down the line. Um, you know, from research in academia to um, uh, sharing intelligence. We have a project called ASIP, Automotive Security Intelligence Platform. Don't know if I was supposed to reveal that, but uh, it's just so cool. I can't help myself. Um, what we're trying to do is, is provide intelligence um, between companies, between individuals, kind of a, a, a platform so that you can peek into um uh, a centralized spot of intelligence for automotive security information. Um, so lots of exciting developments there that we're working on and so on. So collaboration is so important to us. All right, and uh, forgive my cursor there. Just a, a few of our locations here, it's grown so big um, since the last time even that I was leading a presentation here. I mean, we have chapters all around the world. Um, if you aren't a part of one of these chapters, please uh, you know, check out the meetup groups and, and uh, go ahead and join. Um, it really does just kind of show how automotive security is everywhere. You know, every, it, it's individuals working on it all across the world. Uh, if you do want to open up a chapter, reach out to us at hello at asrg.io. If there's not a chapter um, near you and you think there's a good community um, that needs to get together to start working on some of the hard problems in this space. So, yeah, over 5,100 members now um, in 31 locations worldwide. All right. So just some upcoming cool webinars we got going on. Um, so Mert, a, uh, a Ph.D. student at the University of Michigan, will be presenting on Libercan. 
um, some really cool open source software he's been working on for kind of CAN bus reverse engineering. Um, we'll be hearing um, from Atma about the kind of the challenges in securing the multiple dimensions of the mobility ecosystem, not just the the vehicle, as uh, you know, the conversation tends to fall onto. Um, and then we will be hearing from a few other presenters here from Pentest Partners, Moabi, SBD Engineering, um, really cool talks coming up. And if you want to give a talk or you know someone who does, uh, just reach out to us at cfp at asrg.io. Um, we'll get you on the calendar. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, I think we're almost booked for the rest of this year. We have a lot of exciting talks coming up and a lot of people interested. Um, but we definitely do want to hear your voice and we want to get your voice on this platform. Well, without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Kevin Henry here. He's, you know, his the talk title and overview of privacy pres prever uh, preserving credential management for V2X communication. He's joining us from eScript. Um, so Kevin, I will hand it over to you and your presentation is visible. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm going to assume my voice is coming through. So uh, as you mentioned, my name is, is Kevin Henry. Uh, I am a security consultant with Escript in Canada, based out of Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, and so I came to Waterloo by way of the University of Waterloo, which is a very active, um, both uh, smart vehicle um, automotive research center and a uh, cryptography security and privacy research lab of which I was a member. Um, but the, the two groups don't really interact that much, and I was not uh, actively involved in uh, automotive cybersecurity while I was there. However, I did work on problems related to uh, mobile ad hoc networks uh, and, and the security protocols associated with them, so the, the transition to automotive was relatively straightforward. Um, and so if you haven't heard of Escript, we're an embedded automotive cybersecurity company. Uh, essentially, if it has to do with embedded security or automotive security, uh, and especially if it has to do with embedded automotive uh, security, uh, then Escript will have something to do with it. Uh, we're a German-based company, but we're located around the world. Uh, generally, if there's an OEM or major tier one in the area, we probably have some, some boots on the ground there. So I think someone else on the line is not muted. Uh, so moving into to what I wanted to accomplish today, uh, sort of four uh, main sections to my talk. Uh, each of them should help you understand a core part of, of this privacy-preserving credential management system. Uh, so first and foremost, we need to understand what I mean uh, when I say connected vehicle and specifically V2X communication. Uh, so connected vehicle is a very broad term, can talk, to, talk about anything that involves um, vehicles talking to any other uh, entity in the world, uh, but we're talking about a very specific type of communication in V2X. Uh, second step, we need to understand public key infrastructure, um, privacy concerns for public key infrastructure, uh, and a few different efficiency concerns that are specific to V2X. Uh, third, this is the core of the talk, uh, I want you to understand what the proposed solution is to provide credential management in a privacy respecting way. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll give you an update on the current state of deployment, the state of regulation, um, talk about you know, which parts of these systems are proposals, which parts of them are actual deployed systems. All right, so that brings us to our first section, um, our background on V2X and connected vehicle technology. Um, so just a few definitions to get out of the way here. Um, V2X means vehicle to anything. Um, and this puts the vehicle at the center of things, but it it can be flipped around and it can be vehicle to infrastructure or it could be infrastructure to vehicle. It can be vehicle to pedestrian or pedestrian to vehicle. Uh, V2X is the catch-all term uh, for this type of communication. Uh, and it's basically a platform that enables intelligent transportation systems through allowing the sharing of information between all the participants in a transportation network. Um, and so this is based off of a variant of Wi-Fi, um, specifically the standard is 802.11p, um, but it's mostly known as dedicated short-range communication or DSRC in North America. 
Um, there's also a counterpart um, coming out of the cellular industry called CV2X or cellular V2X. Um, so this is not compatible at the radio level, um, but it uses the same, uh, you know, the same sort of building blocks in its wireless technology. Um, and it, it provides a, a similar peer-to-peer broadcast-based communication mechanism uh, for vehicle and, vehicles and infrastructure. Um, and I'll be talking about a variety of different applications in the next few slides, but the, the driving day one first generation applications are the exchange of basic safety messages. So these are simple telemetry messages that have things like a, a vehicle's current location, speed, and heading, uh, which help us predict and prevent unsafe situations. Uh, and messages where intersections are sending what are called map and spat messages, a spat being a signal phase and timing message, uh, which effectively says the vehicle is, or that the intersection is showing a red light for the next 10 seconds, then we'll transition to a green light for 30 seconds. Uh, so making this information available to people on the road facilitates uh, safer driving, more efficient driving. Uh, and anytime we talk about efficiency, this means that somebody is saving money, uh, somebody is using less gas, and so potentially emissions are being reduced as well. So uh, anytime we say efficiency, we're, we're talking about kind of really big gains for everybody. So here's a picture that kind of says what we're talking about. We've got one of these vehicles here depicted as sending messages to everybody uh, in their vicinity. So this is a broadcast-based mechanism. So this isn't five different messages going to five different people. It's one message with five recipients. Uh, and as I said, this contains location, speed, heading, vehicle size, uh, acceleration, turning angles everything you need to know where that vehicle is right now and where it expects to be in the very near future. Uh, so the whole point of this is um, if this vehicle was approaching the intersection, which has a pedestrian in it, if you look closely, um, and was approaching it at a speed that made um, stopping before the stop line unlikely, um, other vehicles in the vicinity will be alerted to this fact and could potentially alert the driver or take an automated action to, pre to prevent a potential collision. Uh, there are other applications of this technology in that uh, if I'm driving on the highway, I can't see if a car 200 meters up the road slams on its brakes until that propagates back through the lineup of cars. Uh, but if we wirelessly broadcast the fact that you slammed on your brakes, you don't need to wait for the human reaction time propagation down the line of cars. Your vehicle knows immediately that something dangerous is happening, happening up ahead. Uh, so these heartbeat messages are sent about 10 times per second. Uh, and this is a compromise between uh, efficiency, making making use of our wireless channel, uh, and not inundating vehicles with too much information, uh, but giving them enough that uh, accurately reproducing the movement of a vehicle is possible. Uh, and since this is a security and privacy talk, uh, it shouldn't take much convincing to say that security and privacy are central to a system like this working. So there are a variety of other applications one could implement if you have a solid secure foundation to build off of. Uh, these include things like signal request messages, so emergency vehicles getting signal preemption, uh, transit vehicles getting uh, preferred signal uh, priority if in a, for the purpose of maintaining a schedule. Um, Freight-based um, signal priority has been proposed. Uh, it turns out that a heavy transport truck burns an incredible amount of fuel going from a dead stop up to highway speeds. So if you can prevent the need for a, a heavy vehicle to stop, you can save a lot of fuel, reduce a lot of emissions, save a lot of money. Um, emergency vehicles, we have lights and sirens. Why not send that wirelessly? Uh, I mentioned before, being able to see cars out of your line of sight or to leverage the sensor data of other vehicles in the vicinity uh, can let you know if unsafe situations are occurring. Uh, and there's proposals for adaptive cruise control and platooning and things like that, which basically say, uh, tell your car to follow the guy in front of him uh, and you'll know within a tenth of a second uh, if their behavior is changing in any meaningful way. So let's flip these arrows around now. Uh, infrastructure is very much part of this network. I mentioned before these map and spat messages, um, but any type of infrastructure, any type of road sign, anything that conveys information to a driver is a potential candidate to have smart uh, functionality added to it and to have its information sent wirelessly uh, to the vehicle. Um, so I've already mentioned this, but these traffic lights might be changing their behavior based off the messages uh, they receive or things they observe about their environment. Um, 
or they might simply be passively listening, uh, gathering traffic statistics uh, in order to enable transportation engineers to change the behavior in a way that benefits everybody. Uh, so when it comes to, to infrastructure-based applications, a lot of the same types of, of applications are possible. Uh, I think my favorite is the Greenlight Optimal Speed Advisory. Um, so this is not uh, a flashy application. It's not going to cause your vehicle to slam on its brakes and prevent a, a collision in a spectacular manner. Uh, but what we're talking about is gently guiding the driver um, to, to adjust their speed slightly so that they're guaranteed to hit green lights on a corridor. Um, so you can envision this as perhaps being an overlay on their speedometer, which paints a little region of it as green and says, if you keep your needle in this range, you'll be guaranteed green lights. Um, so what this does is it can eliminate the what's called the dilemma zone. Um, so there's no longer that few seconds as you're approaching an intersection where you know if that light turns amber, you've got to make a snap decision about whether or not you're accelerating, whether or not you're hard braking, um, essentially reduces decisions that the driver has to make. Um, and again, less starting and stopping means more efficiency, reduced cost, reduced emissions. Uh, so this is kind of a win for everybody. So I think it's a subtle application that has uh, tremendous implications if you can get it deployed and out there. Um, lots of other applications you can envision. Uh, traffic cameras already classify objects, so why not alert drivers to the fact that we see a pedestrian in the intersection. Um, any sign that has text written on it could be delivered wirelessly to the vehicle. Um, intersection movement assist, things like understanding if you're in a turning lane without your turn signal on, uh, an intersection perhaps letting you see um, past an obstruction when turning left, such as a large bus or, or freight truck that you can't see around. Um, and if we get the security right on all of this, uh, there's no reason we can't build tolling, um, parking, charging payment protocols uh, on top of the foundation that we build. And finally, I did mention this pedestrian before. Um, there's no reason why pedestrians can't be part of this ecosystem. Um, we're talking about Wi-Fi and cellular-based technologies. Uh, it turns out most of us carry a Wi-Fi-enabled cellular device in our pocket at all times. Um, this is not necessarily compatible with the, the current proposals off the shelf, but um, we're very, very close to being compatible as is, and it's not hard to envision a future where future smartphones uh, do support this technology. Uh, in some cases, it may even uh, be as simple as a firmware update to an existing device. Um, but I won't make any promises that that's going to be possible, just that you know, we definitely want to include the idea that pedestrians are part of this ecosystem. All right, so this is a security talk. Um, we do have security concerns. Specifically, if your vehicle is going to potentially distract the driver as a result of these messages, if it might take uh, an automated action as a result of these messages, uh, then it's clear that security is important. Uh, so we need to make sure that not only are our classic information security goals of you know, confidentiality, integrity, authenticity, and those sorts of things um, adhered to, you know, we need a way to manage these vehicles over time. Uh, in the same way, you need to be licensed to, to drive a vehicle. Perhaps your vehicle needs to be certified uh, in order to participate in these applications. Uh, and if you, if there's a notion of being enrolled or not enrolled in the system, then we need a framework for managing this enrollment. Similarly, uh, if we're going to be relying on information from the infrastructure, uh, it's important we get that right. Um, and this is not just the security of the over-the-air over the messages. Um, it's the configuration of this. It's making sure you put the right, um, the right messages, the right software, the right configuration at the right location. So I've been on site on a, a pilot site before where somebody had managed to kind of cross the wires when hooking up to the traffic signal controller. Uh, and they configured the intersection to broadcast the exact opposite of the current signal state. So they basically rotated the, the intersection 90 degrees. So if you approach the intersection in your smart car, um, you would see a red light uh, with, your, with your eyes, but your dashboard would give you an alert that says the light in front of you is green. Uh, and so this is obviously making the system worse and not better. We need to avoid situations like that. And finally, if you've been observant, uh, up in the top corner of every one of these diagrams has been this antenna. Uh, so this is really what today's talk is about, is the backend infrastructure that enables the security to happen um, across this ecosystem. So, you know, the ability to sign encrypt messages and all of that is fairly well understood, but the, 
managing the permissions and the credentials around this is really what the core of this talk is about. So that brings us to our next section, which is PKI's privacy uh, and efficiency. So I just wanted to get some, some common terms, some common understanding down um, before we drill into how the system actually works. So our fundamental problem here is going to be a compromise between the authenticity of messages, that is proving that this message comes from somebody who has permission to send it, and that um, as a corollary of that, that has been unmodified in transit. So basically that this message is trustworthy and from a trustworthy source versus privacy. Um, so if you, if you have a security background, as I'm sure our listeners do, um, you're aware that we have a very robust toolkit uh, that we can pull from in order to provide message authenticity. Uh, every one of us has probably done things like online banking, online shopping. Uh, you know about that little green padlock up in the URL bar that says, you know, you can trust the website you're talking to. So this is kind of a solved problem on the internet. It's not, it's an interesting problem. There's lots of subtlety and complexity there. Um, but it doesn't really solve the problem for the V2X use case. And that's specifically because of privacy concerns. So if I told the, the general public that I have this great new technology, um, I want you to install it in your vehicle and everywhere you go, it's going to broadcast cryptographically authenticated, non-reputable proof of exactly how fast you're driving, even if you're driving over the speed limit. It's gonna send undeniable proof that you were in an intersection when the light turned red. It's gonna send undeniable proof that you came to a full stop uh, with part of your vehicle sticking over a stop line. Uh, so in general, we're not going to see widespread adoption of this technology if it facilitates wide-scale tracking of the users within the system. Um, so you could make an argument that people are already tracked on the internet uh, fairly thoroughly. We all carry cell phones in our pocket, which probably enable various actors to track us. Um, but uh, the goal of the system that we're proposing here is not to be the easiest, the cheapest, the simplest way to track people, and it should not facilitate uh, the compromise of an individual's privacy, uh, and it shouldn't be abusable to, to compromise uh, people's privacy once it's deployed. Um, and so, so as I said, you know, we know how to solve these basic problems of authenticity. We've got digital signatures and all of that. Um, the problem is if we can't tie these signatures back to a verifiable identity, uh, something that would facilitate tracking, um, how do we trust the sender of a message if we're not allowed to know who they are? Uh, the answer is going to be with a specially designed public key infrastructure. Um, so this is likely already known to everybody here. Digital signatures are a simple way of binding a piece of information to a public key. Um, so this is very much a digital analog of signing your name on a, a document or a contract, kind of notarizing that contract. Um, so we use a signature to prove that one specific person has endorsed this or, or signed off on it. So you can trust the authenticity of this document if you trust the authenticity of the signature. Digital signatures are exactly the same. Um, they work on a public-private key pair. Um, and if someone shows you a message, a signature, and the corresponding public key, you can be assured that whoever generated that signature must have been the person that holds the private key. Um, so this solves half of our problem. It, it doesn't tell us who has that private key, um, but it does tell us that whoever does have that private key uh, is the one who generated the signature. Um, and so the, the current algorithm used uh, in these proposals is the, is the elliptic curve digital signature algorithm. Uh, this is pretty standard stuff. And in North America, it is defined over the curve NIST P256 uh, in most cases and NIST P384 in some corner cases. Um, so how do we solve this problem of binding a signature to someone we can actually identify, something we can actually trust? Uh, well, this is something we all know how to do without computers. Uh, here I've got a picture of an Ontario driver's license. Uh, and if you look at what this driver's license does, it, it contains, well, a user's signature. So uh, if you look down here, here's John Doe's signature. It's got information about who John Doe is. So a photo, a name, an address. Um, it's got some specific things about this document, such as some unique identifiers. It's got information about the person who issued it, specifically the government of Ontario, uh, information about how long it's valid for, 
information about what you're allowed to do, what type of vehicles you're allowed to drive. Um, and it won't come through very well in the picture, but there are things like holograms and, and microprinting and all sorts of security and anti-counterfeit measures uh, built into this. And the idea is I can show you this license and it proves, so if I show you my driver's license, it proves who I am, uh, that this is my signature, that this is what I'm allowed to do according to the Ontario government. So this says, you can trust me as long as you trust the Ontario government and as long as you trust the security features on this driver's license. Um, so this makes sense in the, in the idea if you're in Canada, if you're in North America, there's a good chance you can show this driver's license to people and they will trust it. If you're traveling overseas, if you're in rural China, there's a good chance if you show this to people they will not trust it. Um, so there's still a determination to be made about which people you actually trust. But if you trust the issuing authority, this gives us um, a way of binding a signature, a way of binding identifying information to a person. Uh, so this is no different than what happens on the internet in a digital context. So here I've gone to script.com. I've seen that familiar green padlock pop up, which we all know means everything is perfectly secure. Uh, so I click on that padlock, my web browser, assures me that everything is great, Digicert says so. So I can ask for some more information. Uh, it'll pop up another window and I can say, well, let's view the certificate associated with script.com. And it'll give me another informative window with a nice presentation of, of what the certificate looks like. Uh, so this certificate is basically the analog of um, photo ID for, for script.com. It is convincing other people that script.com or that the person you're talking to is script.com and nobody else. So if you actually download the certificate, what you get is um, the bit on the left. This is an ASCII armored um, representation of the complete digital certificate associated with script.com. And on the right hand side, we have this certificate partially decoded. So some of the core information has been pulled out of it, but it's got the exact same information that you would expect on a something like a driver's license. It's got the name of the person that it's um, associated with. It's got information about who issued the certificate. Um, it's got information about when it's valid. It's got information about what you're allowed to do with it. Um, and it's got information about the public key, effectively the thing you can use to verify signatures, um, and a few things like serial numbers and, and, and some registration type of info. But basically, this is all the same information we would see on something like a driver's license. And so the idea here is you can take all of this information and you can compare it um, using a validation protocol with, with another piece of information and make a determination about whether or not you want to trust this website. Um, so V2X is built off of a, an alternative certificate format, which is not X509, which is used on the, most of the internet. Rather, it's based on a certificate format called IEEE 1609.2. Uh, and this is kind of a purpose-defined um, certificate format for machine-to-machine uh, -machine type of applications, and particularly for applications which require um, geofencing or location-based restrictions. But the validation process is fairly straightforward. You have some issuing authority that has proof um, that they actually have the permission to issue certificates, and then you've got the, the recipient. So this is script.com in our in our case. So here, the issuing certificate, something about it appears inside of scriptcom certificate. Um, this, the issuing certificate has a list of things it's allowed to do, and we have to make sure that the issuing certificate was allowed to actually certify us to give this, um, to give scriptcom its certificate. So if you go back to your driver's license example, you know, uh, uh, Service Ontario can issue me a, an Ontario driver's license, but they can't issue me a Canadian passport, for example. So you need to have permission to issue whatever type of certificate it is that you're doing. Um, this is the thing that's uh, kind of unique to 1609.2 is it's got a permitted geographic region. Uh, so you can delegate authority to only operate in a, a specific subregion, whether it's be a country, whether it be a, a state or a province or, or some sort of uh, GPS-based polygon. Um, there's a variety of ways you can provide a geofence. Next, um, simple start time and end times, uh, and then the cryptographic validation portions. This public key is what enables other people to trust your messages, uh, and this issuer signature 
is what lets other people verify that this whole package of information is authentic, that it came from the issuing authority. So you would verify that the signature on the certificate is valid, then you would trust this public key, and then you could use this public key to verify signatures on messages that sscript.com uh, is sending to you. Um, so this tells us how to solve the problem of whether or not we can trust sscript.com, uh, but it really says you can trust sscript if you trust thought TLS RSA C1 G1. Uh, so this raises the question, of course, why can I trust this thought TLS certificate? Well, you can trust it because a different person says you can trust it. That is Digicert Global Root G2. So again, we have the question, well, why should I trust Digicert Global Root G2? Uh, and the answer is because Digicert Global Root G2 is trusted by definition. Um, the real answer is um, you know, the, the Digicert Global Root CA decides I am trustworthy because I say I'm trustworthy, um, but your web browser decides to trust it because a group of people called the CA Browser Forum have defined a process, a real world process of auditing, uh, supervisory controls to make sure that these root certificates are operated in a secure manner. Uh, your web browser developer or your operating system developer has preloaded your, your operating system or your web browser with these certificates. So it's kind of a outside the scope of the public key infrastructure, some management entity has done their due diligence to say, okay, you can trust these root CAs. Um, and therefore, these form what we call the roots of trust, and all the other trust in the network is derived from these roots of trust. All right, so traditional PKI lets us essentially bind a certificate to a message. So why doesn't that solve our problem? So here I've taken our, our old picture and I've stuck the driver's license on every single one of these messages. Um, if we implement things in this way, I'm essentially driving around announcing to everybody, hey, my name's Kevin Henry, here's my license, I've got permission to send V2X messages, you can trust me because the issuing authority, the government of Ontario says you can trust me. Um, this does not meet our goal of preventing tracking users on the road. Um, an approach like this might work if you're a, a traffic light who doesn't have privacy concerns, if you're an emergency vehicle that might want to be trackable or uniquely identified, um, but I would not be comfortable broadcasting this type of information out to everybody on the road. Uh, another consideration here. Uh, on the right is our sscript.com certificate, um, and this is a fairly large message. I know large depends on the context, um, but this DSRC communication platform has relatively limited capacity um, limited bandwidth uh, to send messages. Um, so the idea that our certificate is large compared to the data we want to exchange um, poses a problem. If we have a, a roughly 300 meter communication range and we're looking at a busy eight lane highway packed bumper to bumper, um, I'm sending 10 messages per second. Everyone in a 300 meter radius is sending 10 messages per second. Uh, the overhead of a certificate like this actually induces a lot of strain on the system. Uh, so the 609.2 certificate format is smaller than X509. Uh, and, and one of the reasons is specifically to address this problem, but uh, there are other things we can do to make these credentials even smaller. Uh, so here's a picture of a traditional certificate, kind of simplified things down. Um, our certificate contains our public key, which is the important piece of information we want to convince people is authentic. You can use my public key to verify my messages. It's got the metadata that says, you know, who's vouching for me? How long is it valid for? What am I allowed to do? Uh, and we've got the signature. This is what proves that the whole package is authentic and it's certified by some trusted third party. And we use this to stick a signature on our messages so everybody can verify them. The alternative approach here is something called an implicit certificate. Uh, so in this approach, we're taking the, the signature portion and the public key portion, and we're compressing them down or combining them into a single field in the certificate called reconstruction data. And now the verification process uh, becomes a, a two-step process. Now you have to take the, the input from the certificate, the input from the certificate authority, run it through a reconstruction function. This will give you a public key and then this public key can be used to verify a signature on the message. Uh, and if you compare these two side by side, um, 
I will say I've drawn them roughly to scale. Uh, you can see that the implicit certificate is much smaller. So for the, the B2B safety applications, um, these certificates, they, they can range in size quite dramatically based on what's inside of them. But on average, they're approximately 150 bytes. Uh, and of this 150 bytes, um, 64 bytes of it is dedicated to the signature, uh, and 64 bytes is dedicated to the public key. This is because these are NIST P256 elliptic curve points. Um, and this explicit certificate has the property that you can verify the validity of this entire certificate using the signature that was placed on it. Uh, the implicit certificate, by comparison, is 64 bytes smaller because we've eliminated that signature field. Uh, so, you know, it's over, well, it, it's, it's less than two thirds the size of the original certificate, which is a pretty dramatic size savings. Um, but there's a drawback here. Because there's no signature in the implicit certificate, I cannot take the certificate and answer the question, is this a valid certificate? Because um, the proof that it came from the, the correct CA has been removed from it. Um, but if we go back to our previous slide, um, we can verify a signature with the certificate. Um, so the reason it's called an implicit certificate is you can't verify the validity of the certificate by itself. But if you go through this validation process of reconstructing the public key and verifying a signature on the message, um, if this whole process validates, you have implicitly verified that the certificate must have come from the CA. Uh, so the, hence the name, uh, we have an implicit validation of the certificate rather than an explicit independent validation of the certificate. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about these, these are called ECQV certificates uh, or elliptic curve Q Vanstone certificates. Uh, and these are used um, for all the over-the-air messages in B2X communication. All right, so that brings us right to the, the core of the talk. Uh, we're going to start from the ground up and build ourselves a public key infrastructure that facilitates um, privacy, that avoids this needing to uniquely identify people on the road. Um, so starting for our most basic message problem is that we want to send basic safety messages to everyone on the road. Uh, on the right here is a sample of what a basic safety message looks like from the standards. Uh, but effectively, you've got fields like latitude, longitude, um, transmission state, so are you are you moving or not, uh, speed, heading, steering wheel angle, braking status, um, all the same, sort of, same sorts of things I've mentioned before. Um, but this message by itself, of course, is not trustworthy because it has no no signature, no certificate, no anything attached to it. Um, but we are talking about privacy today, so I did want to highlight something specific, and that is um, this is a common problem in privacy enhancing technologies is no matter what you do to make your system private and to make it secure, you cannot stop the user of a system from putting personally identifiable information into their application messages. Um, so I highlight the size field here because it turns out with centimeter accuracy, vehicle size is roughly unique to a given make and model of vehicle. Uh, and depending on the context, if you are the only owner of a certain make and model of vehicle in the areas you travel in, um, this basic safety message by itself might be enough to uniquely identify you. Um, so addressing this problem is outside the scope of what we're talking about today. This does have remedies. You can, you can round your um, vehicle size up to the nearest 10 or, or 50 centimeter bucket, for example, um, to increase your privacy set. Um, but attacks like this are outside the scope of what we're talking about today, uh, but still very important for providing privacy in the application space. So uh, we've already talked about PKIs. We understand how, uh, what sort of strategy we could take in order to authenticate these messages on the road. So let's assume that there exists a commonly trusted CA. So every vehicle on the road will be preloaded with the CA certificate, um, and this CA will issue vehicles on the road a certificate so that they can sign their their BSMs. Um, so this doesn't really solve our problem, but it gets us a, a step of the way there. Um, just because I put a signature on this message doesn't mean that everyone else in the network knows what my certificate is. So we need a mechanism for delivering the certificate to everybody else. Uh, so there's a simple solution to this. Why not just include the certificate with your message? Uh, this is what happens on the internet. Uh, if, if you connect to sscript.com, one of the first things your web browser is going to do is say, okay, you support TLS. Give me a copy of your certificate so I can verify it. 
Um, so, so we don't really have a session-based communication protocol happening here. I don't know who I'm going to be talking to. I don't know who's going to receive my messages. Uh, so I can't really do anything other than attach my certificate to each message I send so that as I'm driving down the road, everybody I encounter knows who I am. Um, now, of course, I, I went to some, had a few slides earlier about the efficiency of the system, making sure that our messages aren't too big. Um, Again, if we picture things as being roughly to scale, and actually this message is smaller than it appears in this diagram, uh, this is a lot of overhead just to, to, to add security to the message. Uh, our message is probably in the, the 50 byte range, but this picture shows 200 some bytes dedicated to security on the message. So that's a lot of overhead if you're sending that out every time. So the general strategy people have adopted is to only include your certificate on every 10th message that you send. So within a second of encountering somebody on the road, um, you will learn what their certificate is, but you don't need to have prior knowledge of it ahead of time. Uh, on every other message, you're going to include an 8-byte certificate digest instead. So this enables other people to determine if they have seen your certificate for, before uh, and to know which certificate to apply to this message. Um, but it keeps the overhead much, much smaller uh, on a message by message basis. Um, now to come to no surprise, I mentioned implicit certificate before. Um, we are going to use implicit certificates instead of explicit certificates um, so that our certificates get that much smaller. Um, so now things are, are closer to being to the right scale. Um, our messages are going to look like this. We're going to attach this implicit certificate to every 10th message. Um, and this will enable validation of these messages on the road. Uh, I mentioned before, an implicit certificate cannot be validated on its own, but our use case here um, is that it's always attached to a signed message. And so there's never going to be an issue in validating um, an implicit certificate because it's always associated with a piece of signed data. All right, so now we're gonna take a little break and talk about something we didn't mention in the PKI section. Um, so, so far we've talked about the idea that certificate authorities issue certificates that provide some sort of proof of identity or proof of um, permissions um, about somebody in a network. Um, but this is really, really only half of what a CA's job is. Um, the CA's job is to provide proof of somebody's trustworthiness or their, their status within the network. Um, but much like a driver's license can be revoked if you violate the law, um, a certificate needs to be revocable uh, if we want to maintain trust in the system over time. Um, somebody could pass all their audits, somebody could be granted a certificate, and then choose to maliciously act within the, net, within the network once they have permission to do so. Um, and the, the need to revoke isn't necessarily due to malicious action. Things can be misconfigured, they can malfunction, um, or we can simply decide that they've, they've reached the end of life and they want to be, we want to safely remove them from the network without letting that credential potentially be leveraged by another person. So the ability to remove people from a network is just as important as the ability to add them to the network. Um, and so this is a fairly solved problem. Uh, the, the usual way we handle this is by having a certificate authority publish and authenticate a list of those entities which it no longer trusts. And so as long as you have an updated CRL, a certificate revocation list, um, you can always check any incoming certificate against this list to make sure it's still in good standing. So this is a mechanism that lets the CA prevent um, any given user of the system from, from becoming a problem and it lets us remove them uh, when, the, when this becomes necessary. Um, but this doesn't solve the problem of the CA itself being a potential point of failure. So a CA could become compromised, it could malfunction, it could engage in malicious behavior. Uh, so we need to design around certificate authorities as a single point of failure. So we've already seen this before in that Digicert certifies thought certifies sscript.com. Um, and the idea is to split the uh, certificate issuing duties uh, into more than one piece. So we've got a, a root CA which can be uh, kept offline, kept behind multiple locked doors, multiple different keys, multiple different key holders, uh, under strict access controls, not plugged into any external networks. You know, do everything we can to make sure that compromise of this root CA is, is as difficult and as expensive as possible. And we're only going to wake it up, say, once a month to 
sign new ICA certificates if needed or to or to update CRLs. Uh, and so I mentioned ICA. So ICA means Intermediate Certificate Authority. Uh, and that the root CA is basically going to delegate its day-to-day -day activities to an intermediate certificate authority. Uh, so this ICA can stay online. Um, it's still going to be protected, but it's going to have a much larger attack surface than the root CA does. Uh, so it'll be the one that issues these certificates to, to actual end users. So in our website case, it would certify escrip.com and however many other websites. Um, but basically, it's going to be issuing certificates on a frequent basis. Uh, so its private key is going to be in use on a, you know, so let's say, minutely or hourly basis versus the, the monthly basis of the root CA. Um, we can also use multiple ICAs. Nothing says you, you need to have a single unique chain going up to a root CA. You can have a tree-based structure so a root CA can certify more than one ICA. It can limit the abilities of an ICA. So it can say ICA1 is allowed to certify basic safety messages. ICA2 is allowed to certify MAP and SPAT messages. Um, so we can minimize the impact of failure um, by using different uh, types of certificate chains. Um, and in the end, all, of the, all that we really care about is that the certificate that's issued to the end entity, to the vehicle, uh, is valid, and that we can chain it back up to something that we trust. Um, but all we've really done here is recreate the, the exact same scenario we had uh, with the website example. Uh, we haven't solved the privacy problem at all. We basically said our, our proposal here is to stick a copy of my driver's license on every message, uh, which is going to let me be tracked. Uh, so let's actually get some privacy controls put into the system. Uh, so before we do that, we need to figure out what we mean by privacy. Uh, and this is a tricky question because um, the nature of these applications requires a, a vehicle to be trackable over short periods of time. Uh, the whole point of these safety applications is that I know where you are and where you're going so that I can figure out if we're going to collide or that if you're going to run a red light. Um, and if I'm falling behind you uh, on the highway for an hour, um, you know, I'm already in a sense tracking you. So no matter what you do with your over-the-air messages, I, I am going to be able to figure out who you are. Um, so a few of the properties that we want to stick to are that there should be no personally identifiable information um, in our certificates and in the messages we send. So nobody should be able to take a message they receive, look at this message without other correlation and say, uh, I know this message belongs to this specific vehicle or user. Uh, and we also want to go with a, an anti-tracking framework, um, which is more along the lines of, if I see you today and I see you tomorrow, nothing in your signed messages should suggest that you're the same vehicle. Um, so over, over short trips, while well, I'm following behind you, yes, your over-the-air messages will allow me to track you or at least um, correlate your movements with high confidence. But if we cross each other on disjoint trips, there shouldn't be any, uh, any evidence that you're the same vehicle based on what you're sending. And, and who are we providing this privacy against? Who's our attacker? Well, uh, we're explicitly communicating with other vehicles on the road and with infrastructure on the road. Um, and particularly in the connected infrastructure case, um, I would expect a local transportation authority to own and operate all of the traffic signals in my region. Um, so we effectively have a, a global eavesdropper as part of the network. Um, and so we want to make sure that a person who owns all of the, the road infrastructure is not able to track vehicles over time. Uh, but another really important observation is we don't want the back-end infrastructure. We don't want the certificate authorities to be able to track vehicles over time. Uh, and this is a much trickier problem to solve. Uh, and this is because a certificate authority needs to authenticate and authorize devices before issuing a certificate. Um, so this is kind of an analog to a, a notary public. Um, the, the certificate authority's job is to say, you can trust this person because I say you can trust them. Um, but if they're not allowed to track my behavior over time, if they're not allowed to uh, know something about myself, you know, you know, I can't get a driver's license without going and showing some other ID and passing some tests, uh, they're not going to give me a certificate. Um, but the solution to this is something that's commonly used in, in, in other privacy enhancing technologies. Uh, and it's actually a familiar real world system that we use. And that is to decouple the, the authentication and authorization check of the device. Uh, from the actual um, certificates that it's going to use uh, when engaging in 
in signing and sending BSMs. Uh, so if you've ever visited an all ages event where alcohol is served, uh, or if you've gone through a ticketed entry event, you've probably encountered something similar to this in the past. Uh, so if I go to a, a large event and I want to order alcohol, um, they might have a station where I can go to have my ID checked. And if the, the person will check my ID, you know, make sure it looks like a genuine driver's license or, or photo ID. And if they trust it, they will give me some sort of tamper-proof wristband, uh, which signifies to other people, I have passed an ID check, I have permission to order alcohol, but it doesn't require me to show my driver's license or my photo ID to the bartender every time I get a drink. Uh, so we're gonna use a, a solution similar to that. Um, so this diagram's got a lot more complicated now. We've got our root CA up at the top like before, We've got our intermediate CA like that, and now we split the network in two. On entry to the network, we're gonna to talk to an enrollment certificate authority who's going to give us an enrollment certificate, which proves that I've passed all of the, the checks needed to enter the network. Uh, and this might involve real world, personally identifiable information to make sure that I can't get more than one of these enrollment certificates. You know, the, going back to the event example, means I can't get a second wristband that I could slip to my underage friend, for example. Uh, so we do all the checks here to make sure you're allowed to be in the system. Uh, and we give you a credential which doesn't contain any personally identifiable information, just proof that you're allowed to be here. This enables you to request authorization from a different certificate authority. This one's in charge of saying, you're allowed to send basic safety messages. So they give you what we'll call an authorization certificate. And then now uh, we have this problem where, or we've solved this problem uh, in a sense because the enrollment certificate authority doesn't know which vehicles get which authorization certificates. So the enrollment certificate authority can't link your authorization certificate to your real world identity. And the authorization CA can't link um, your authorization certificate to any personal identifiable information either. Um, so this gets us part of the way to solving the problem. We're not, we're not revealing personally identifiable information directly to the CAs, um, or we're at least limiting that to the greatest extent possible. But the authorization CA still knows my authorization certificate. And if it's the only authorization certificate I have, I'm still trivially tracked as I drive around uh, on the roads. So uh, let's switch from using the term authorization certificate to pseudonym, uh, because what that previous step did is it basically uh, went from saying, you know, my name is Kevin Henry, I'm allowed to send, or I'm applying to send basic safety messages, and it switched it to, to giving me a a pseudonym. It let me go to the registration authority or the, the pseudonym uh, issuing authority and, and say, uh, I'm John Doe. You don't need to know my real name. Here's proof that I'm allowed to be here. Uh, so what we're going to do now is instead of giving you one pseudonym, we're going to give you potentially dozens of pseudonyms. Uh, so proposals are anywhere between 20 and 100 pseudonyms um, in the current system. Uh, but basically, you know, instead of getting being John Doe number one, you can be John Doe one and John Doe 250 and John Doe uh, 612 and so on. So you'll have all these different identities you can present to the world, none of which are correlated with each other. Um, and so now the authorization CA, um, or now, now other vehicles on the road um, can't use your single pseudonym to track you over time because every five minutes you're going to randomly pick a different one of your pseudonyms and switch to it, um, provided it is safe to do so. So some general guidelines around this. Um, if your vehicle hasn't moved very far, you probably shouldn't change your pseudonym because then you're leaking information about which pseudonyms you possess to, to other listeners in the area. Um, if a safety related event is taking place, you don't want to change your pseudonym because it causes confusion. Uh, but in general, we rely on the end entity, the, the vehicle, uh, to shuffle these up and send them out to Peter, and to, to appropriately choose a new one every five minutes uh, to prevent tracking over time. Uh, but as this note in the bottom of the slide says, this authorization CA still sees all of the individual pseudonyms. He can still track you over time, uh, even if nobody else can. So let's see what we can do about that. Uh, the answer is to decouple things yet again. Uh, let's try to come up with a way where the authorization CA, the person issuing the pseudonyms, doesn't actually know which vehicles are going to receive them. And again, doesn't even know if two pseudonyms are going to the same vehicle or to different vehicles. Uh, so in order to accomplish this, 
we need to have multiple vehicles involved in the system concurrently. So here I've, I've drawn three vehicles here. They're all sending their requests via this new intermediate registration authority. Uh, the registration authority collects these requests for pseudonyms. It shuffles them up uh, and then it sends them up to the authorization CA for um, for signing, for generating the, the correct pseudonyms, and then it sends them back to the appropriate vehicles. Um, so the, the technical aspects of this are not included on the slide, but basically the vehicles encrypt their certificate request directly to the authorization CA. Uh, so the registration authority knows who these requests are coming from, at least the enrollment certificate associated with the person they're coming from, but it can't see the public key or or any of the certificate data because it's encrypted directly uh, to the recipient. Similarly, when the authorization CA generates the pseudonyms, they're encrypted directly to the vehicle. Uh, so the registration authority, again, does not see um, the individual certificates, um, but based on metadata, based on a combination of synchronous and asynchronous processes, it is able to route these messages to the correct recipient um, without knowing the contents of the messages. Uh, and so this basically removes the link between um, the, the authorization CA who generates the uh, certificates and knowledge of which vehicles actually receive those certificates. So has this solved our problem? Um, I guess I'll, I might touch on this later. There's some clever crypto tricks that allow this process to happen efficiently. Specifically, you can send one request to the registration authority and it can turn this into thousands of requests on your behalf, which helps it enable this shuffling and intermingling of requests with many other vehicles. Um, so at this point, we've, we've come up with a framework that makes us pseudonymous against um, insider attacks. No one can track me, at least not easily. Um, but is this, you know, I, this sounds like a good thing. Uh, but is this really the problem that we wanted to solve? Uh, I mentioned before that a CA's responsibilities include revoking trust when necessary. Uh, and we've now created a system where nobody knows who has what certificates. So I have a hundred pseudonyms I could present to the network, and now nobody has the ability to remove these hundred pseudonyms from the network unless they catch me misbehaving individually with all 100 of those pseudonyms. Um, so we, we've, we've achieved privacy, but we haven't really achieved accountability, or we've taken away the, the ability of a CA to do part of its core functionality. Um, so we need to come up with a way of tracking which pseudonyms go to which people, but in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, and the solution we're going to use is to put some special keyed pseudorandom information into each of these certificates. Uh, basically, we'll use a keyed pseudorandom hash function evaluated at pre-specified values. Uh, this could be as simple as evaluating at uh, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, uh, to generate a sequence of values which will all go into the um, certificate. Um, and if we do have a need to revoke people, we can use this keyed pseudorandom hash function to reveal the linkage values that went into these certificates and to recover the, the sequence of, say, 100 values um, that ended up at the same vehicle. Uh, so this would be a great technical solution, except we've already gone to a lot of trouble to, to say that no single person in the network should be able to break privacy. And my solution to this is to introduce a new person in the network who's allowed to break privacy. Um, so if we want to keep with the theme of there being no single point of failure, no single adversary that can compromise privacy, this says we need at least two people involved in this process. Uh, so what we've added here is two linkage authorities. Uh, these linkage authorities are responsible for providing what I'll call pre-linkage values into the certificate generation process. And again, these are encrypted directly to the recipient, uh, but the registration authority gets metadata that helps it um, match these two requests uh, and ensure that they, they get attached, uh, that a sequence of 100 linkage values gets attached to the appropriate set of 100 certificate requests. Um, so uh, an analog of this, you can say, all the messages are sealed in tamper-proof envelopes that the registration authority can't open, um, but the registration authority can scribble some notes on, on the outside of this envelope in a way that doesn't leak any information, and it can do some clever bookkeeping around the order of which it sends messages out and gets them back that enables it to put the right bits of encrypted information together without actually knowing what that encrypted information is. And so in the worst case, if we have incontrovertible proof that somebody on the road has misbehaved, 
um, the two linkage authorities working together can use the linkage value inside of that certificate to determine which chain of linkage values, of pre-linkage values that, that, that they generated for that certificate. You can combine those into the associated linkage values that came in those certificates. And this enables you to identify those certificates and, and place them onto a certificate revocation list. So we're almost done. There's one last little step we might do if you're extra paranoid. Um, if we don't trust any of the CA components, uh, we might want to eliminate even more personal information, uh, and that is your IP address or your network address. You know, if I don't want the registration authority to know that my two vehicles are both connecting back to back from the same IP address, uh, we can use a simple off-the-shelf NAT proxy or or load balancer type of device uh, to ensure that all of the uh, network level information is obscured from the backend credential issuing. So that has been building up to a big process of uh, private credential issuing. Uh, this is only a part of the picture so far, and there's still a few more problems we'd have to solve, and these are problems I've hinted at before. Uh, I'll start with the second one on the slide. Uh, early on, I asked the question, how would you decide that Digicert root CA is trusted? And oh, it's trusted because the CA browser forum said it was trusted. Um, it's trusted because the person who developed your web browser decided it was trusted. Uh, we need to solve this problem in the connected vehicle context. Uh, and we want to keep our design philosophy of there should be no single point of failure. Um, so we, um, we need to come up with some sort of entity who's responsible for publishing the list of trusted root CAs. But we want to design it in a way where, again, it's not a single point of failure. Uh, and so the system does have a, a multi-party management. Um, a technical management aspect defined. Uh, and also, we just talked about the, the process for uh, linking pseudonyms together if we do need to revoke somebody. Um, and, and so I think I use the words, you know, if you had incontrovertible proof that this vehicle is misbehaved and we need to remove it from the network, um, then we have a technical means to do so. Uh, but detecting or coming up with this incontrovertible proof is, is quite difficult. Um, if I have 100 different pseudonyms, and so does everyone around me, um, how do I know if a sequence of messages from 10 different people um, are all coming, are all, let's say, one-off sensor glitches or allowable behavior? You know, if we have 99.99% .99 accuracy, there's still that 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000, 1 in 10,000 chance that something goes wrong. Um, how do I tell if a sequence of... Um, misfires, a sequence of incorrect messages are, are random innocent events, or if they are correlated intentional events or a malfunctioning device. So how do I know if these are all coming from the same person or all coming from different people if we've designed the system in a way that prevents you from learning exactly that information? Uh, so there is a whole misbehavior management and detection aspect of the system, which would be its own entire talk uh, by itself. Uh, so that brings us to the, the last section of the talk. This is a, a short uh, five or less than 10 minute overview of the, the current state of affairs. So we're, we're almost done and I thank you for your patience so far. Um, so what I've been building up to is something that's called the Security Credential Management System. Uh, so this is a, a formally specified, complete privacy preserving um, public key infrastructure to secure a connected vehicle uh, communication. Uh, and whether you realize it or not, you probably have enough information now to understand virtually everything that's happening in this diagram. It's just a lot to take in when you put it all on, on one page. So if you look up here, we've got a root CA. We've talked about this already, and it certifies an intermediate CA. We talked about that early on. Uh, and part of this process is we have an enrollment process that happens in its own separate box to make sure that all the real world information is isolated from everybody else. Uh, then we have a pseudonym issuing box here, and this is exactly what we just talked about. We've got a location obscure proxy, uh, a registration authority, uh, the linkage authorities, and the pseudonym issuing CA. Uh, something I just talked about was this problem of misbehavior detection and, and management. That's what would happen in this box over here. Uh, and I said we need some sort of non-single point of failure way of um, managing who is trusted in the system. That's what would happen in this box up here. Uh, 
all the stuff up here, this is more on the standards and document maintenance side of thing, policies and procedures, not on the technical side of it. Um, so hopefully at this point, you could look at this diagram and convince yourself that you've got a pretty good idea of how this works, why the system evolved this way, uh, and what sort of privacy problems it's solving. Uh, and for a bit of context, uh, this system was or designed by the Crash Avoidance Metrics Partners, or CAMP. Uh, so this is a group of OEMs and industry professionals that was convened by the US Department of Transport. Uh, and they, they built the requirements for the system. They uh, oversaw the development of a prototype. Uh, and this prototype has been deployed to support connected vehicle pilot sites in the United States. Uh, similar systems have been used uh, in Canada. And uh, standardization of this process uh, was formally handed off to IEEE. Um, and this standard has made its way through the, the standardization process and it is now in the, uh, the, the editing and publication process. So the standard is complete. Um, it is frozen from a technical perspective. It is simply going through editorial revision uh, and it should be published by the end of this year. Uh, unfortunately, what you're looking at here is actually the simplified version of the system and everything we've been talking about is is the basic system, but there, there's even more going on if you're interested. Um, but just a little bit of background on connected vehicle in general. Uh, in January 2017, the USDOT published a notice of proposed rulemaking, which basically said, we are going to mandate the use of V2X technology in all new vehicles. It's going to be a phase rollout over five years. It's going to use the IEEE 1609 wave protocol stack. So this is the um, the dedicated short range communication Wi-Fi protocol. Uh, it's going to use IEEE 1609.2 for its certificates. Uh, and it's going to use the security credential management system to manage credentials. Uh, and since this announcement almost four years ago, we've all been waiting patiently for this to happen. Um, if you think back to January, 2017, you might be able to think of other political events which may have changed the direction of certain regulatory agencies in the United States. Um, and so all evidence nowadays says that uh, the, the emphasis has kind of shifted to an industry-focused approach. Um, but as a member of the industry, I can say there is definitely an industry appetite to push this technology forward, uh, even if it is not mandated uh, by the federal government. Uh, and this is both in uh, Canada and the US, I'll say. Uh, the other note in the slide is the FCC currently has a notice of proposed rulemaking, uh, which proposes taking a good chunk of the 5.9 gigahertz band, the dedicated vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle public safety band um, and giving it over to unlicensed Wi-Fi. Um, so this is, uh, they're not completely killing the dedicated spectrum, but they're drastically shrinking it, which makes some of these efficiency concerns um, much more critical to think about. Uh, so this is a pending regulation of rulemaking that uh, will also impact the potential to roll out this um, technology on a national basis. Uh, so what didn't we talk about from the standard today? Um, well, using a PKI in a vehicle is not a new problem, um, especially since the GPAC kind of brought security to the forefront of everyone's mind. Um, automotive OEMs have really stepped up their, their security game, uh, and they, they have all sorts of reasons to get their vehicles enrolled in public infrastructure uh, for a variety of purposes that are not V2X related. Um, so the standard does make um, concessions for existing public key infrastructures to facilitate skipping the enrollment process or to use your existing PKI as proof of enrollment. Um, I mentioned before, there's a special cryptographic technique called butterfly key expansion used in the standards. Uh, and this allows you to do things like send a single request for a vehicle from the vehicle and to store a single private key, um, send that to the registration authority and have the registration authority on your behalf generate thousands of certificates from that single public key or coordinate the generation of those certificates from the single public key um, without um, such that each of those pseudonyms has a different public key inside of it uh, in a way that lets you recover the corresponding private key on your side when you get access to those pseudonyms uh, and this even allows the the generation process to continue in your absence so the, the registration authority could generate you a, use, a year's worth of certificates uh, and without your interaction, they could get to work on generating the subsequent year's certificates uh, to be ready for you when you revisit again using this key expansion technique. Um, 
there's a lot of interesting questions around pseudonym issuing strategies. So I mentioned uh, 20 certificates per week or maybe 100 certificates per week. Uh, but there's a lot of subtlety here around, well, how many is the right number? Is one week the right validity period? Because um, how we issue them has a lot of implications and overhead, um, particularly if we have to revoke them. Um, if one user misbehaves, we have to put 100 entries on a CRL. Um, if so, maybe more certificates makes the system more private, but less efficient. Uh, there's also questions about what you do when these certificates expire. Um, if all my certificates expire at the same time and I'm in the middle of a security critical event or a safety critical event, what do I do? Do I switch to a new batch of pseudonyms and introduce confusion into the mix? Do I keep using an expired certificate? Should I make sure there's a long uh, overlap period? Um, so there's a lot of interesting open questions you can ask about the, the strategy around managing hundreds and thousands of certificates per vehicle. Um, and finally, revocation is a, a very difficult problem. There's a lot of alternatives to revocation that are being discussed specifically to keep CRLs small. Um, these include some things like um, blacklisting, so preventing you from downloading new certificates. Um, if you've misbehaved rather than updating a CRL, uh, and an alternative called activation codes for pseudonym certs, uh, which is basically using key escrow and broadcast encryption, where vehicles are have their certificates kind of unlocked on a weekly basis, provided they remain uh, in good standing in the network. All right, so I've got one last slide before we, we wrap things up. Um, I wanted to put these two systems side by side. So on the left, we have the security credential management system. This is North America's proposal. Um, this enables privacy preserving revocation. Um, using the process that we laid out, uh, but there's a similar system that's been proposed in Europe. Uh, and if you take a look at what's happening here with the, the five or six different people that enable privacy and look at the corresponding section of this of the European system, uh, you can see it's a much simpler approach. Um, and, and I could give a whole talk on the design philosophy differences between these two systems, but fundamentally this comes down to different assumptions about how frequently vehicles are online, uh, what sort of interactions between the components are appropriate. Uh, and a really big distinguishing factor is that active revocation and removing, and removing people from the network uh, was not part of the European design. And so privacy preserving revocation was not part of, of their initial specification. Uh, and the privacy preserving revocation is a big reason for all of the complexity in the North American system. All right, so a one slide summary here. Uh, if you take away anything from this talk, uh, hopefully you're convinced that the security credential management system is a purpose-built public key infrastructure that facilitates credential management in a privacy-preserving manner uh, for V2X communication. Uh, hopefully I've convinced you that it's mostly or capable of doing its job, uh, but as you've probably observed, it's a pretty big, complicated, unwieldy, possibly over-engineered approach to this problem. Um, but it does have some standards approval, it does have some industry approval, um, and, and it, it does appear positioned to be the, the system that will secure connected vehicle uh, in North America. So I'm happy to take questions at this point and very much thank you for your attendance and your patience and uh, attention. Kevin, thank you so much for this talk. I thought this was, uh, I mean, it was such a technical deep dive in such a short amount of time. I mean, there are, I think the audience questions were reflecting um, exactly that, that, I mean, there are just so many questions and it really alludes to how complicated an infrastructure like this is. I mean, it's not an easy problem to solve uh, by any means. Um, so before we dive into some of the questions brought up by the audience, uh, you talked about V2X in usage for basic safety messages. Um, I mean, just to help support this conversation, what are some of the other use cases of V2X that come to mind when we're thinking about uh, privacy? So, so the reason I focus things on the basic safety messages is because it's the they're very much broadcast-based messages sent in plain text to, to all other recipients. And, and by their design, they contain information that, um, that might allow you to be tracked, but also that the whole point is that this information is made available to other people. Um, so I think the, 
privacy is going to remain an issue for a lot of the other applications, but uh, we didn't talk about it today. The, the standards support the encryption of messages, the certificates can all contain encryption keys. And so if you're doing things like negotiating um, signal priority, you don't have to drive around broadcasting to the world. I, I have permission to, to request signal priority. You can identify the intersection you're driving up to, encrypt a message to that intersection with proof that might include more identifying information uh, to request your signal priority. Um, and, and so the basic safety case is kind of a canonical one because it, it really highlights the need for these pseudonym certificates. Gotcha. And I think that's really important that we, uh, you know, reemphasize that the focus here is on broad broadcast based messages, where even if you do were not passing any, uh, you know, important or identity um, providing information, you're still broadcasting something. And if, if in any way you can be identified, for example, you know, hey, this message, I see this message broadcast out front of my whatever, whatever this one sensor um, every morning. Therefore, I know that this car goes by every morning. Um, you really don't have to, to pass any kind of PII here in order to identify uh, the vehicle. Um, you know, I, th I think that, for example, the, the way that this has been demonstrated today is uh, Wi-Fi SSIDs in cars, where if you have uh, listeners for SSIDs all over the place, um, you know, you can you can track where a vehicle's been based on where you see that SSID popping up. And so they've had to uh, introduce uh, randomized SSIDs in cars every time you start it up to help address that. Yep, and there are companies out there who who look for Bluetooth beacons coming out of people's cell phones in their cars, um, not to track individuals. They're, they're mostly doing it to track, you know, did the same car go through this intersection followed by that intersection for statistics purposes? But, you know, there are companies out there whose whole business is tracking you based off of wireless emanations from your vehicle. Yeah. Um... So, you know, I'm, I'm going to try and follow the questions here as they were asked. Um, and, you know, we'll see where this conversation takes us. Um, Alan started by asking a, kind of a technical question. So you, you have all these devices on the network. Now we're introducing pseudonyms and, you know, lots of cert, certs moving. Um, is there a concern for... Uh, collisions here in any way, or is key uni uniqueness a concern, especially given the small size of these V to X messages? Yep. So um, I mentioned early on we so the certificates these are using uh, so public keys and, and all this are generated over NIST P two fifty six, which is a, a very large key space. Uh, collisions are negligible. We'll ignore that fact. But the I mentioned that we don't include the certificate with every message. We sometimes just include uh, a small eight byte digest of the certificate. Uh, and so eight bytes, sixty four bits, that's um, when you're talking about encountering that, well issuing certificates to potentially millions of vehicles, uh, collisions in that space um, are are going to happen. Uh, I don't have the, the mathematical analysis on hand, but I've seen uh, some some back of the napkin type of math, which says uh, an eight byte identifier is likely to collide maybe once or twice in the lifetime of a vehicle. Um, and to be honest, I can't actually tell you if there's standard defined behavior for what to do uh, in the case a collision happens. I can tell you that certificate authorities are one certificate authority should never issue two certificates with the same eight byte identifier. Okay. Um, so I think the next question is CRLs. You know, I, I think you got mm -hmm. to, uh, at the end of the end of your talk here, you, you had kind of pointed out that CRLs are actually, they're still a really challenging problem. How do you disseminate them? At what frequency do you disseminate them? Um, you know, some some people are looking at blacklisting instead. Um, yep. Can so, you just talk to, about some of the practical, you know, uh, uh, considerations there? I mean, for example, 
um, you know, how quickly would a car go on or a cert, I guess, go onto the CRL? How quickly would the car next to it see that CRL? And what kind of attacks are there where, you know, for example, maybe I want to be on the CRL because that is the type of attack I'm trying to um, uh, leverage. All right, those are some some great observations. And as I mentioned, uh, the topic of misbehavior would be its own uh, hour long talk if we wanted it to be. So uh, I hinted that Europe and North America are different systems. And, and one of the, the core differences between them is a connectivity assumption. How frequently are vehicles going to be connected to backend infrastructure? Uh, so I think in the early days, there was this assumption that vehicles should be allowed to continue to participate even if they go months or years without being able to contact um, the backend infrastructure. Uh, I think nowadays people, you know, as things are more connected, um, we're looking at more of a connect to the, the infrastructure on a weekly or at least within the month basis. Um, so part of the, the North American system, the need for active revocation was based on the idea that you were issued certificates for up to three years into the future. So if something goes wrong, you've got permission to keep going for up to three years. So we've got to actively remove you. Europe's approach was to give you permission to participate for maybe this month or the next month. And so if something goes wrong, well, we'll just stop you from coming back. We'll blacklist you and then you'll naturally expire within a month. Um, so that still allows you to, to continue to misbehave. Um, but it, it means if you don't address the problem, it kind of goes away on its own. Um, but uh, one of the, the huge challenges in investigating this behavior here is our Sybil attacks. The idea that one user can present many different identities into the network. Uh, and so this happens not just on the malicious side. So I can pretend to be a hundred different people when I misbehave, but I can be a malicious reporter. I can point at you and pretend to be a hundred different people who say, you're lying about something. You know, I, I detected your message from downtown Toronto, but all hundred of us think we're driving in downtown Vancouver. So you must be misbehaving. You should be revoked from the network. Um, so it, it's really tricky to, to do this. And that's why I did not include a lot of what happens in this. Well, there's this misbehavior authority in the diagram here, who is the, the magic black box that can determine if misbehavior occurred or not, and who's vested with the power to confer with the linkage authorities to do this investigation. Um, but, but I would say the misbehavior aspect is the biggest um, hole or gap in the current standards. Um, and, and it's an absolutely valid concern to say that if we give you 100 certs per week and we give you certs for three years at a time, that you know, simply getting a few hundred vehicles revoked requires tens of thousands of entries on a CRL and, and does severely weaken the system. And so you need really judicious application of uh, updates to the CRL. So there's a bit of musing, but maybe not satisfactory answers yeah, to everything. Yeah, I mean, it's such a, such a uh, large challenge. Um, you know, it, you, it kind of introduces feasibility questions. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe these are all theoretical challenges and in practice, uh, maybe not that many people misbehave, so it becomes a manageable issue. Um, or, you know, I, I'm not totally sure there, but it certainly does seem, in theory, a very, very big uh, issue. For sure. I suppose so, I could say that revocation lists can also, it doesn't have to be vehicles that get revoked. Uh, you can revoke a certificate authority as well. So if if you find out this pseudonym certificate authority hasn't been doing its job in vetting its participants or, well, it doesn't know a lot. If the enrollment CA hasn't been doing its job in making sure, you know, only the right devices are getting enrolled into the system, uh, you can invalidate that enrollment CA, which knocks out every enrollment certificate it's ever issued with one CRL entry rather than many CRL entries. So John and Richard were going back and forth in the comments here. Um, the, a lot of the solutions here 
for to retain privacy rely on decoupling. Um, mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, the way you reverse that is to recouple things. You know, some of the the privacy preserving here relies on no collusion between different nodes in this network. Um, in addition, it relies on no collusion between nodes outside of the network. And so uh, I think Richard was was pointing out, well, you know, what if you just defeat this whole system by kind of tracking a pseudonym and how the pseudonym is changing based on, you know, you know the, the cameras or other infrastructure that does provide uh, 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 information or identifying information of the vehicle. Um, I mean, I guess what's your response to that? Um, no, so those are, are great points. And so there's a few different responses, I would say. So one is we have the technical means for, for providing privacy here and all the separation of knowledge. Um, when deployed as an actual system, um, this isn't always a satisfactory answer to, to InfoSec professionals, but there are also meant to be policy controls in place on top of this. So this misbehavior authority, um, the recoupling of information is meant to happen under strict supervision. Um, so there's, it's natural perhaps to not trust a random authority to not want to introduce a trusted third party into the system, but you know, in legal frameworks, we have the notion of warrants. We have the notion of of, of things like that, that there are certain people who are empowered to do certain things, but they have oversight, they've got strict scope. Um, a topic I didn't really talk about is, you know, we've decoupled all of these pieces of information, but uh, what does that really mean? Are these distinct servers running in distinct data centers run by distinct administrative teams? Or, you know, are they different Docker images all running on the same server, and I promise not to ever correlate the information on them. Uh, that's another sticky deployment topic to get into. Uh, on the global eavesdropper side of things, um, we have heuristics that say, yeah, you should travel a certain distance, you should wait a certain amount of time before you change your identity. Um, and of course, if you have a pervasive global eavesdropper um, correlating um, across uh, a pseudonym change is is not challenging. Um, you know, if, if you're sending messages every tenth of a second that tell me exactly where you're going to be in a tenth of a second and you change your identity, pretty easy to figure out you're the same guy. Um, so, so this is one of those system performance parameters. Is, is 20 a week going to be enough that you'll leave the view of the eavesdropper? Will 100 be enough that they, they can't correlate you over time. People have observed things like the first pseudonym you use and the last pseudonym you use are very sensitive because they're correlated with destinations. If um, you know, if, if I know that your pseudonym is associated with a residential home address um, and I correlate that with a different random pseudonym, then I've uniquely, probably uniquely identified you in the network. Um, so really, this is a trade-off and a, a full pervasive global eavesdropper with complete information um, is probably going to be able to track you. Um, and I guess my counter to that is, you know, if you have a cell phone in your pocket, do we already have a pervasive global eavesdropper that is tracking you? Uh, if your connected vehicle, independent of this technology, is going to come with multiple SIM cards installed on it so the OEM can track you and so that the, your, your maps and your digital services provider can track you. Um, I'll draw back to that observation that uh, in order to retain functionality, we can't avoid all tracking, but we can make a strong effort to not be the easiest or cheapest means to track people over time. And so there, there's, I think, a good faith effort that's been made here to, to not facilitate tracking. Yeah, and you know, I, I think at the the end of the day, you kind of have to, to ask yourself, how is this going to play out? Um, you know, how it, how it how it played out in the 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 existing internet space was, you know, tracking kind of just happened because there was no oversight, and then a lot of people started making a lot of money off of tracking and advertising based on that tracking. Um, 
and now you're seeing kind of lawmakers and and uh, and others uh, trying to figure out how do you address this issue with regulations like GDPR and CCPA. Um, you know, you you kind of have to wonder at some point if um, if this is just something you you know the end user can opt in or out of. Um, what do you think of that? So I've, uh, I'm involved in a project that requires um, some more detailed analysis about bridging the gap between theory and deployment. Uh, and we, we have asked this question of, well, so I'm Canadian. Uh, we Our governing privacy law is the is PIPIDA, the Personal Information uh, Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Um, and, and it has all sorts of provisions, very similar to GDPR, that says companies have to provide me with my information if I request it. Um, companies have to ensure that my information is accurate, they have to delete it when I'm no longer a subscriber, they have to get my consent before they even collect it. Um, and there's a lot of tricky questions here which says, well, in some sense, my pseudonyms are associated with my vehicle. They are personal information because they are associated with an identifiable individual, even if they are not personally identifying. Um, so what are the obligations of these back-end CA components? We've gone to a lot of effort to separate the knowledge out so nobody knows what's what, but we've also taken away the end user's ability to exercise their rights under a certain privacy law. Um, and I am not a lawyer, so I cannot tell you if this is even an issue or not, um, but I think it will be very interesting to see how a system like this interacts with um, privacy law, uh, particularly if people try to misuse or abuse the system. Um, way back early in the presentation, I hinted at the, you know, we don't want to send cryptographic proof that you are violating the law, but that's effectively what we're doing. And so when a, when an Amber Alert, a national security incident happens and some someone with the right authority says, I need to know everything uh, for national security purposes, um, I'm not sure how the system would respond to something like that. But at the same time, you know, cell phones already do this. So, gotcha. So basically, saying that you know the data could be assembled. Um, yeah. It, so I'm, yeah. I'm a I'm a tech person with an interest in privacy law. You really need a privacy lawyer with an interest in tech to to answer some of these questions. Yeah. So. Kevin, for for my own um, curiosity, um, you know, are there applications here that have been considered uh, in in sign kind of some of these newer spaces like blockchain that help address some of these issues, um, or anything like that? Um, so. Short answer is I'm not aware of very concrete proposals, but that's probably not due to them not existing. It's simply me due to them not being on my radar. Um, and so I think, again, if there, if there are blockchain experts on here, I know they will criticize my lack of understanding. So on the surface, I would say a blockchain is not suitable for certain things like uh, low latency, um, communication and validation of these messages and any any sort of key management or, or proof of possession or things like that. But where I see it potentially having applications are um, something like uh, CRL management and distribution, if there's kind of a synchronized way of updating or having many different people pushing updates to a, to a single location. Um, I can see applications like that. But if you're doing anything payment related, especially if it's privacy centric, um, just like any other payment related technology, if you have the ability to perform anonymous transactions, um, that might complement a system like this very well where, you know, you don't want to go to a bunch of, if you have the ability to use your pseudonyms or to use some sort of anonymous identifier to pay a toll, to, to pay for parking, um, this could be an authentication platform, which might facilitate that. But, um, I'm not sure if there's something meaningful about this construction versus you now have a, a transportation layer, a transport layer that you can build applications on top of, and the application layer can utilize blockchain as it pleases. 
So last question from the audience. Um, and I think you touched on this a little bit, um, but where is the, I mean, so Tor is a good kind of parallel. Its intent is to um, uh, anonymize internet usage through onion routers. Um, mm -hmm. Yet, still with some, you know, statistical analysis of, of watching which are the most active uh, uh, Tor routers um, and, you know, where is traffic going from and, and coming from, you can kind of start to make assumptions or uh, educated guesses based on where a user is probably coming from. Where are these right. statistic, the statistical weaknesses here? Is it with you know pseudonyms and uh, um, you know I, I'm not I'm not sure. I, um, where do you think they are? Uh, so that's a good question. So since you bring up Tor, um, we talked about decoupling of information, and Tor is a, a great example of that. That you know someone knows kind of who you are, but you might even use an entry guard so that, you know, you don't even know which first hop you're talking to. Uh, and we use these multi-hop um, paths to, to basically limit who knows what so that only if you're kind of end-to-end -end connected can you really uh, correlate anything. But of course, we know we have global eavesdroppers that are capable of correlating things on the Tor network. Um, so I'm seeing if I can easily jump to an earlier slide without shutting down the presentation. So uh, I had this slide up before and I did highlight that, you know, your application messages might contain person identifiable information and you might need to take care to, to do that. Um, so this is going to be a pervasive problem that, for example, if the way you populate your latitude and longitude, you know, maybe you're, you're using some, I forget how long these fields are, but they've got several digits in them. If you're a, a sender that never puts an odd value for some quirky reason into these fields, you know, that might identify you. Um, but there is an application layer standard, um, which is meant to pair with the pseudonym change process to make correlating people over time um, as difficult as possible. So when you change your pseudonym, this is your kind of application level identity, uh, the lower levels of the communication stack are going to do things like change your MAC address at the exact same time. Uh, they are going to introduce a random offset to your messages because you're sending things at a, a 10 hertz pulse. They're going to add a something like a 250 random 250 millisecond jitter to your messages so that um, you start broadcasting at a different offset when you change your pseudonym. And also over time, they sort of make sure you're not broadcasting on strict 100, mega, 100 millisecond intervals, but you know, 95 to 105 millisecond intervals. Um, so people are aware of uh, protocol stack issues that might be fingerprintable. Uh, I'm not a single signals person. I have read a few papers in the past, and I'm pretty sure a clever person with an oscilloscope uh, can look at two different wireless transmitters and distinguish them um, in various scenarios. Uh, in a lab, certainly. In a controlled outdoor scenario, certainly. With 100 vehicles in the road, I can't say for sure. Um, but I certainly would not rule out somebody with the right resources even being able to pick out the sound of your engine as a fingerprintable thing. Uh, everything I've learned about privacy enhancing technologies is uh, with uh, sensitive enough sensors and with enough classification, you can basically distinguish anything you want. And so uh, not to say it's a lost game, but it's, yeah. a, it's a tough problem. Yeah, no, I, I, and I think that sums this talk up well, is that this is privacy enhancing that we're thinking about, not pri privacy preserving. Privacy um, preserving is just so challenging when you think about maybe one stack is able to preserve privacy, but, uh, you know, there's just so many ways and uh, to fingerprint and, and the ways that systems leave footprints and stuff that it is just a hard problem. So, Kevin, I really appreciate you giving this talk. I think it was uh, very in-depth, yet um, kind of uh, brought light to some of the challenges here in a understandable way, and I, I really loved it. Is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we close out here? So I was a little paranoid about the amount of time I would take cramming so much information into here. 
Um, I know this is an automotive security research group. Um, there are lots of interesting problems in this area. The misbehavior detection, if you're into machine learning and that sort of thing. Um, you know, part of the problem of working on a, a real standardized technology, you know, we've got to cite algorithms that are in NIST approved standards. We've got to align with uh, automotive processes, but uh, there are a ton of cutting edge um, cryptographic techniques and privacy enhancing technologies, which could enhance a system like this. If you know, blind signatures, anonymous credentials, things like that. Um, this feels like an antiquated approach to PKI stretched to its absolute limits. Um, I think there's, if you're interested in this problem space and you have the expertise, um, you know, there's a lot of interesting problems to work on. And uh, I wish I could have dedicated five or 10 minutes to really talking about the research problems and not just the technology. So, so check it out if you're interested. Wonderful. All right. Well, with that said, uh, I think we'll go ahead and close out here. So Kevin, thanks again. Um, and uh, potentially, you know, we look forward to having you or someone um, from your, your team at Script joining us in the future. Um, would be excited to have you back on. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and close this out. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, thanks for all the great questions. I think this was a really good conversation and uh, lots of really good questions. Um, so, so, yeah, we'll see you next Thursday, hopefully, uh, when we'll get to hear from Mert about Libracan. All right, everybody, be safe, stay healthy, and talk to you.